Hey, morning, Alex. Um, in fact, probably good afternoon. Uh, good morning. <sighs> By the way, I noticed this um, session when, when I just joined, it said recording, right? So Zoom can now do automatic recording now. Yeah, all, all of the uh, meetings are, are set to automatically record and then they get posted to YouTube, so they're they're available for the public. Okay, yeah. So I, I don't I I know that I just don't know that you can automatically recording a session in in Zoom right now. Every time we have to manually click the button. Yeah, I think I think there's a setting you can you can use when you set up the Zoom call for each room. Hey, Aaron. Morning, you beat me here. I was having Zoom issues and I had to reboot. <laughs> and then I was figuring out, oh no, there's gonna be people on and the meeting isn't started. We're good, all right. Hey, Alex, uh, which time zone you are in? I am in the UK time zone. Okay, GMT. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, Erin, which, which time zone you are in? I'm in a uh, mountain time zone. So oh. I'm an hour ahead of Pacific. Okay. Yep. Okay. Oh, it's still early morning. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not too early. Plenty of cups of coffee into. <laughs> yeah, I basically <laughs> just got up, uh, get up like one hour ago. <sighs> Are you on? Um, yeah, I'm. I'm on the uh, Pacific time zone. I'm. I'm based in you know, I'm based in San Jose, in fact, currently. Okay, great. It's like we have pretty light attendance today, Alex. Uh, yeah. We should wait a couple more minutes. Yeah, sure. Yeah, with the UK, we're in we're in this weird week where everything is off by an hour because Daylight savings went back last Sunday, oh. but in the US, but in the US, it goes back next Sunday. Uh, yeah, you know that uh, California has voted to cancel to, to cancel the daylight saving, but it's only on the like state level, and they said that you have to get permission from the federal level to really remove it, right? But then yeah. it also has a, another problem. Say the California is going to have a different time zone compared to. Uh, say uh, Washington and uh, Oregon, right? That's going to be weird because you are basically on the supposed on the same time zone. So, well, but this daylight saving things, I heard it's like um, hundreds of people probably have a higher risk of uh, stroke every year because of like change of the schedule and change of clock stuff. Not really sure why I still need it. Yeah. Never knew they could correlate it with health problems based on the time change. Yeah. I, I think quantum time is good because you don't, oh no, in fact, uh, I, I don't think Arizona has daylight saving. Right, they don't. Okay. Yeah, but not all the mountain time, I guess. All right, I think 
we don't have a lot of people who joined. Oh, we've got a couple more now. Um, but I'd suggest uh, I suggest we we um, we we can start and then we can share we can share the recording if need be. Okay, sure. All right. So yeah. So I was going to ask you this question: Which screen do you see? Uh, I see the full the full screen um, okay. um, presentation page. Yeah. Okay, that's good. All right. So uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, for uh, joining this session. And uh, so as you know, that Longhorn is currently a CNCF sandbox project, and uh, we are applying for the incubation stage. So this is the uh, Longhorn incubation review. All right, so uh, for this review, first I'm going to go through a few like recaps about basic of Longhorn, why we do it and how we do it. And the later we can uh, go through that, how Longhorn has grown uh, growth um, and things join the CNCF and the was tractions and I uh, was on the roadmap I see. So feel free to interrupt me at any moment and uh, yeah, so let's get started. All right, so what is Longhorn? So um, Longhorn is uh, an open source distributed story software for Kubernetes. Our goal is pretty clear. We want to have very simple and uh, very uh, very simple way to add a persistent story to your cluster. So one click installation to add persistent story support for any Kubernetes cluster uh, is the goal we, we want to have. And also the things is, uh, there's a few things like differentiate Longhorn from others. So we call them the design principles of Longhorn. So uh, first is the reliability and because it's a storage software, right? So the, the last thing you want to do is like lost your, lost your data. So Longhorn provides crash consistent and make sure that in every data you write to the Longhorn volume will be right and preserved on the disk. It's no cache in between, right? And the second thing is Longhorn provides multiple layers of protection against the data loss. So that's including the building snapshot mechanism, which is inside the cluster and also the backup support, which going to backup the snapshot to offsite, to outside the cluster to, uh, for example, S3 or NFS server. And in fact, there's a third layer compared to some other solutions is if you have your Longhorn uh, use the directory, data directory available, in fact, you can directly extract the data from that given that you, for example, you lost your whole Kubernetes system and you lost your whole every metadata. Right, that is the one thing that based on because of how Longhorn works, that is possible for Longhorn to do so. So I'm gonna go through the architecture a little bit later. The second thing is that we want Longhorn to be very easy to use. So one click installation, we, we are going to detect your environment and choose the best way to install Longhorn. So uh, previously that means, in fact, this helped a lot during the early days of Longhorn when the uh, 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 Kubernetes has the driver choice of the flex volume and the CSI. We migrate to CSI at like in CSI 0.3 and later 0.4 and upgrade to 1.0. But in fact, even like sometimes you have to choose flex volume for the Kubernetes distribution doesn't have it. And the CSI different versions, in fact, is not really compatible. So we build something called the driver a deployer to automatically detect the version of your Kubernetes and, the, and, the, and install the compatible CSI for you. Um, now it's the less a problem because everybody has standardized your CSI 1.0, but a lot of still a lot of effort we made in to try to make this um, manual configuration installation process as easy as possible. Another thing is the uh, Longhorn provide the polished user experience including a, a building the main UI. You don't need to have like third party UI or like add, add on for that. So that is all, all included. So you can operate Longhorn uh, many like create volume stuff inside uh, the Kube control, of course, but you can also do that from the UI and you can see the dashboard and to show what's the, um, the system level overview looks like and the perform the backup, restore snapshot scheduling backup, those kind of operation on the UI as well. The third thing is the maintainability. So the one, the one thing about maintainability is, is, is more like by design. 
right? Because when you made your design choices to say how you how this software should work, it's going to decide that how easy or how hard it's going to be maintained. So Longhorn is designed to be easy to be understand. So when I will talk about a little bit more on the architecture later, but the really goal is make sure that even you don't really have like very complex storage background, you can understand most of concept and understand how Longhorn works, right? Then also Longhorn provides a way to easy to recover even in the worst case scenario. That is as long as, well, I mentioned there's three layers of protection, as long as you have any one of them available, you can recover your data in, in, in for recover your data of your cluster, right? And Longhorn also provides upgrade without interrupting workload. Uh, that is also what we call the live upgrade feature, which means that uh, you can feel free to up upgrade your Longhorn, in, including Longhorn data engine, and the, when you still have the running workload, right? So that's really like reduce your downtime, reduce your scheduled maintenance window when you want to do the continuous uh, like a deployment, uh, when, when you want to do the maintenance work for, for your cluster. All right. All okay. right. So, yeah. So here is our latest release and the 102. And on the right side, I have left a bunch of the, uh, the uh, features. And I will just go through them very quickly. And this, Distribute block server software. Well, in the 1.1, upcoming 1.1 release, we're aiming to add read write many as well and using NFS. And that's going to be built in. So uh, I'm going to call the distributed story software in the next release. And the volume sync provisioning means that volume are over provisioned. We are in the underlying, we use the link sparse file to preserve the metadata and the data, right? So this doesn't take extra space unless you use the up to the old spaces. And volume snapshots and backup restore. Snapshots are, we define snapshots are the, uh, the, the history snapshot point inside the cluster, which as soon as you have this volume inside cluster, you can revert back and stuff. And the backup, and it's going to be outside the cluster, right? So that we support incremental backup and incremental restore. So volume expansion, and you can resize the volume across AZ replica scheduling. This is mostly for some uh, cloud in, uh, vendor environments, and they want to have the enhanced availability across the whole, whole uh, across different AZ in the same region, right? So then you lost one AZ. <clears throat> Sorry. Then if you lost one AZ, you still find and storage type for node disk selection and uh, across class that DR volume with defined RTO RPO and live upgrade I mentioned before and the UI one to click installation and more. All right. So any questions so far? Okay. All right. So this is the overview of how in how Longhorn works on the knees. So currently we have two nodes here. Both node has a storage and RAM and the CPU. And the Kubernetes asks Longhorn for a new volume. Right. So this when this request comes in, Longhorn is going to create two replicas on preferably on two different nodes because we want to have like a uh, if one replica went down, we still have the replica available on the other node. I can show, I can demonstrate the process of failure recovery later. So then Longhorn is going to create an engine to connect it to those replicas. And the engine is going to expose the block device to the volume, right? So this is very simple way of doing, like to, to set up this the data pass to provide the storage for the, for the port to use. If we are going to have the second part asking for a second volume, we do the same. And the third part, we do the same. So there are two um, advantages of this approach. The first thing is you can see that the data path of each volume is not, it's not intertwined. It's basically isolated from each other, right? So if one volume go down or even one engine go down, it's not going to infect, uh, like affect any other volumes, right? Another thing is you can see the engine we have here is always collocated with the part with the workload. So in the in the most common scenario that we want to guard against for the HA cases is the node down. But in this case, um, if the node one is down, for example, and then the engine, the volume work, the engine will be down, of course, but the workload part one will be down as well. Right, so then the Kubernetes is going to 
like reschedule the power to another node and the engine can be like just moved along with it and everything will be back to normal. So that's greatly simplifying our design for the engine because we don't need to have one engine to call like more than one node. And then this, we don't need to have really complex mechanism to do the HA engine. Right, so, um, but how does this, how, how, why there's nothing like this before, right? So the problem is because engine, the replicas, in fact, are microservices, they are currently running as processes, right? And the, uh, and the first version, in fact, when we come up, this are running on H1 as a container, as pods, but we do hit some limitation later, so we change them into a process. But in the end, those are separately orchestrated entities. So it's pretty hard to do this without the help of Kubernetes, right? If it's possible, right? So that's why this mechanism, this way we choose to do it is basically, it's bound to the Kubernetes. It's with the Kubernetes help, we can do this. Otherwise it's going to be like, we have to write some, our own scheduling mechanism to move this part, move this engine process around those stuff. That is why we, we that is why we only see is this kind of mechanism coming, this kind of architecture coming until now, right? This is basically because of Docker, of Docker's ability for you to package one service in a single container and the Kubernetes ability for you to schedule new part around without really adding too much of overhead on your side. Hey, hey Shang, so just a quick question. Um, so is, Effectively, does every volume have its own engine? Yes. And and is every engine a separate process? Yes. Okay. And does does every replica have its own process, or or is, yes. or is that? Yeah, every replica has its own process as well. So uh, a little bit of history that we will design every engine the replica to be a Docker container instead of a process and the, and the first version, I think before 0.6, right? But later we have a one user go in and complain, wow, I have a huge, I have a very, very big machine. This is so beefy and I can run like a 20, 30 workload on that. And then I need a 20, 30 volumes. Well, but all those engine and replicas take, take place inside the pod. So then I going to have like, well, 80, if I really run them on a single node, they'll have 80 or even minimal 40 pods. And they just take a lot of course because that is only allowed at 110 pods per node, right? So then we, decide, we just decide, okay, so it seems to make more sense that we um, aggregate it to a way that they are running as a separate instance, a separate process, but they are on the same node. So we save that resource on the pod level. So that's why uh, in the next page, you will see something called instance manager. That is uh, why um, and how it works right now. Right, okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, just a related question. So these engines replicas, are these like built using Kubernetes primitives or they are not like Kubernetes based? So for example, does the engine correspond to a pod or some Kubernetes abstraction or? Uh, uh, yeah, so the engine itself doesn't re doesn't correlate to a pod. It was re related to a pod, as I said before, but uh, because of like port limitation we had on the Kubernetes, it can only be 110 pods per node, right? So we, we decided to not take that resource like up uh, later, right? So now the engine is running inside the pod, right? And uh, there can be multiple engines running inside that uh, we call the instance manager pod. I can explain more on the next page. Okay, all the way till the next page. Yeah. All right. Okay, so this is some detailed review of the architecture of the engine side. You can see that now we have three nodes and the, um, the node, you can also see that there are some nodes, they have a spare disk for long-form like uh, this black colored the SSD, we can use that for long-form. But you have like uh, some what's yellow colored which we assume is a root disk. You don't really want to use it for the storage, otherwise you might introduce unwanted like disk pressure stuff, right? So you want to have separate, you have to want them uh, separated. And also you can see that for the node that's with 
without uh, uh, with the storage for long run, you have a replica instance manager running on top of that. That means those nodes that are potentially able to run replicas, but for the every node, because they are able to, all of the nodes that here are worker nodes, they are able to run uh, using the long run volume. So the, you, we are going to have engine instance manager running on top of that. So let's take the same example. We have port A and we want to create uh, the volume for port A. We have replicas scheduled on two different nodes, node one, node two. And then the replica process will be started inside the replica instance manager. And the engine process will start inside the engine instance manager on the same node as the pod A, and then connect to expose the block device to, uh, to pod A, right? Pretty straightforward. And you have pod, we have pod B on the, on the uh, node two, and we do the same thing. Pod C on the node two, we do the same thing, right? So next question is what's going to happen if the node, node A when uh, node one went down? So if node one went down, as you can see in the previous page as port A, in fact, the volume A going to have, we have the engine on node one and the replica on node one and two. Node one went down and port one, uh, port A, everything went down, right? But because it's Kubernetes, Kubernetes is going to decide that, okay, so I saw this node down. So I'm going to reschedule this part to another node. I found the node three. So Kubernetes rescheduled the pod and restart it on the node three and say, no, pod A still need the volume. And then the Kubernetes ask Longhorn for the volume and Longhorn see that, okay, so there is still a, a data of this, what workload is inside the node two, as you can see that right, the red replica there. And the Longhorn is going to start the engine on node three and connect it to the red replica and resume the service to the pod A. Right, so that is the how the um, just the, in the uh, overview. If the failure happens, how the recovery works in the Kubernetes world. All right, any uh, any questions? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, so so it seems basically instance managers and replica instance managers are kind of like daemons. So they run on every node, right? Uh, if you wanna. Um, but they are. They don't. Like a demo, demo set, but in theory. Yeah, so, but they are in fact just controlled by uh, the Longhorn. We build the controller for them because, for example, when you, when you don't have available disk on the node, you don't really need a replica instance manager, right? So that, that's why we build them as a, as a separate controller rather than just using daemon set, right? But every one of them is a, definitely a pop. Okay, and then like now the failover scenario that you described, do we also constitute a new replica on the on node three, the failover node. Uh, yeah. So currently, yeah. so if there's node four with available disk on node four, they yeah, we'll recreate the replica, of course. And because node three doesn't have a disk available for the Longhorn, right? So that's is that is why we don't do the uh, rebuild of the replica on node three. So of course, if node one went back, we can reuse that replica. Does that answer your question? Okay, I, mean, I saw like the red SSD icon, so I thought Node 3 also has local storage, which oh, can yeah, be used. Oh yeah, that uh, SSD, yeah, is the, what we, yeah, I want to indicate that this is kind of different. That is for the root file system, right? So that's is the, uh, the available disk is like much as uh, those um, black or gray colors, right? So the SSD on Node 3 is not really for the long-haul storage. So that is also why we don't have the replica instance manager running there. Hey, so quick, very quick question, and maybe you might come to it in, the, in this in a future slide. But if, if as you said, um, node one, you know, um, reboots or recovers and and comes back onto the network, um, so the 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 engine on on node three can then reconnect to the to the replica that's on node one. Uh, yeah. But, but but would it would it have to? I, I assume it would have to resync it right at that stage. Yeah, so uh, currently in the 1.x, um, we, uh, we always rebuild a new replica, but for the upcoming 1.1 1, 1, 1. 1 release, we're going to try to start using the existing replica, but of course, any replica we use to either rebuild a new replica or using existing replica, we're going to check and sync the data before we can use it. It's always going to be that case. Yeah, we cannot just blindly use it anyway. Right. 
also the recovery workflow that you outlined, does that also happen when you do, don't add any new nodes? So let's say if you already had another node three that was already serving some engines and some replicas, can that take over serving the engines and replicas of node one that failed? Like you don't necessarily have to add new nodes to replace node one. Is that possible? Uh, sorry, I don't quite get the uh, question. Um, so in this example that you showed, once node one failed, you added a new node, node three, and uh, then node three became not, responsible for not, all the... Yeah, so in fact, node three is always be there, right? So this this not running like a related workload at the moment, but node three is inside cluster. So yeah, of course, if you want to add a new node, the new node will have the engine instance manager and pods, and like if you the Kubernetes decide to schedule pod on that node, that's still going to work, right? If you say, if the, like say, if you don't have node three and you have node two and a Kubernetes decide to schedule this pod A on node two, yeah, it was still, it was still going to work. It's not, it's not different. I just using node three to make like the concept more clearly here. It doesn't, doesn't need to be. So the Longhorn's engine and the replica is unless you enable a certain feature called data locality, it doesn't need to be on the same node. Does that make sense? Um, so I think these are separate issues, but I think locality here really, like as far as long corner is concerned, a pod that is consuming a long core volume has to have a just a local engine. Yes. But the actual data, the actual replica can be on a different node. Yes. Right? Yeah. All right. So, and nothing prevents any node from serving engines from any other nodes, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, so I, I don't quite understand what you mean by serving engine, but yes, any engine, as long as there is a replica inside this uh, Kubernetes cluster, and then you can have engine connect to that replica and the serving, serving the volume, yes, from any node inside the cluster, as long as you don't have like a limitation on that part. Uh, so, so just one last question, kind of related to that. Um, so, I'm, I'm assuming um, an engine is spun up within the engine instance manager as part of a Kubernetes controller receiving a request or something, perhaps via CSI or something like that. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of speculating, um, but how how do you make the decision? To, to schedule a replica on on any particular nodes is is that is, is there is there some some logic or determination there or or, or is it around dropping or um, yeah so this basically come down to the the, the nodes that first is the first thing is of course the node of the disk should have the space right otherwise assuming they should have the space. And the second thing is they have to meet the uh, restriction as like like storage tag. For example, I always I have to schedule this warning with this tag with the disk on this tag or node on this tag. They have to be there. And the third thing is if you enable the hard end infinity, which is enabled by default, and then the replica need to be scheduled on the different nodes, right? Always going to be on the different nodes. So if you don't have a different node to satisfy the, that requirement, they are going to be scheduled failure. And those parts, and also there's a bunch of other scheduling rules you have to apply. Once you pass all those filters, and then you have, we are going to get a like available list of the disk. And after, after that, we're going to just pick one from them because all of them meet our scheduling uh, like requirement. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. so. Uh, this is on engine and the next slide is on the manager. In fact, this is going to be even simpler. So we have a Kubernetes cluster and the Kubernetes cluster want a warning. So who I talk to? The Kubernetes cluster is going to talk uh, to the local CSI plugin through the CSI interface, right? The local CSI plugin is running as a demo set on every node and then it was going to talk to the local manager, which is also running on the demo set for the, on every node. And the local manager's work is to orchestrate all the volumes and the determine like, a, and also a local manager is the in fact a Kubernetes like a controller 
and he going to, for example, I ask him for a new volume. So local manager going to create a volume CRD object and store that in the Kubernetes API server, right? Of course, backed by ICD or others. And then the controllers, the volume controllers inside local manager watch for that object and say, okay, this is the new volume object coming. So I need to create a replica and engine for it. And then it decides to create those replica and engine and the form the, form the uh, volume and provide it to the user. Right, so it's always going to be it's going to be the same when you have asking for more volumes, and the local manager is going to create more engine and replicas, and orchestrate all those volumes and uh, provide it to the user. Another way to complement the Kubernetes cluster, Kubernetes primitive, is to, is the local UI. So because the local man because the, on the CSI we normally in charge of like create or delete volumes, attach detach mount. Stuff and now we add the ability to do the snapshot, which is in fact the backup in the Longhorn. But before that, so Longhorn UI also can do node management. For example, you want to add more disk to this node, and also doing the backup and the snapshot, and you can also set a recurring snapshot, which means that you want to take a snapshot or take a backup every morning at one a.m. and you can ask Longhorn, you can use Longhorn Manager to configure it, but it also. Of course, if you uh, if you prefer, you can also use the Kubernetes storage class to configure that as well. Yeah, so local UI is currently a complement for the uh, the CSI plugin, and then they have the bad combination of them uh, both. They will have the full functionality which we expose to the user, and then in the future we are going to introduce a local CLI as well to allow you to uh, program it, uh, program those logic inside your, for example, your maintenance script or stuff. All right. Okay, so here is the comparison to the existing CNC project. Uh, well, I'm just go, go through them line by line. And the first one is uh, what's the position? And for long term, we always position to be a full stack storage software. And uh, compared to Rook, which is, I think, it currently is graduated, and the position as a storage orchestration. And OpenEBS is also full stack storage software. And the, the second part is about the engine. What's this data engine? What's this underlaying? So Longhorn has a Longhorn engine, which we custom, we, we build ourselves. The Rook is uh, currently, I think the most common use case for the Rook is using the Ceph, right? OpenEBS, they, <clears throat> they have a, a few bunch of choices, including Jiva, which in fact is the fork of Longhorn engine about two, three years ago. And the performance wise, the Longhorn performance is on par uh, with the Ceph and the OpenEBS, uh, well, I say it depends on which engine you use. And the, the GUI on the Longhorn side, Longhorn has built in GUI and the Rook has depends on the engine. I think Ceph has a dashboard and OpenEBS, um, they, I think they have a UI, but they provided that, uh, I think probably at the actual cost, if I remember correctly. And for the backup restore and the cross DR, Volume uh, go back and restore Longhorn uh, because we uh, um, we aiming to provide those functionalities like uh, in the the most user friendly way. So we currently have the backup restore as a building option, right? We do incremental backup and then we do incremental restore, which is the this DR volume option layer there. And I think Rook uh, and the Ceph itself doesn't have like building backup restore, but Rook can uh, take advantage of the using the third party software to do so. And I think it's the same for the open EBS. Uh, for cross cluster DR volume uh, disaster recovery and long home build this on top of our backup restore feature. And that is the really provide a way for the user to use it easily. Um, like you have a backup cluster which up and running in no time if the main cluster went down. So I, uh, and in fact, I'm not certain on the answer for the root and open EPS here. I haven't uh, seen uh, something similar here. Um, Shang, so it, having Rook on here, just being a storage orchestrator, do you guys plan to extend the way that you do orchestration to other storage providers? It's maybe a good comparison on here, even though it's not an existing CNCF project, I think maybe it would be helpful for the TOC to understand for just the cloud native landscape in terms of storage and how long Oh, Okay, so uh, yeah, so yeah, you can do that. So uh, what other storage options you, you want to ask to come back to? Um, I just think maybe as we 
take this into the CNCF if you guys are meant to present there that rough here maybe is maybe not the best comparison. We should maybe have cloud native storage options. And of course, there's tons of them within Kubernetes and understand how Longhorn fits against those in terms of functionality because Rook can actually deploy Open EBS and Ceph and MinIO and many other uh, ones. Yeah. So, so I, I would I'm just providing a recommendation. I think yeah. it would make more sense. Yeah, in so yeah, we can, we, like, we definitely can do that. The the, pro, the the why we list the root here is uh, when you look at uh, like a storage like a, a storage uh, project focus on more focus on the, like block storage level. There's probably Open EBS root and Longhorn. They're really mentioned together pretty often. So that's why. We put the rook here, yeah. But but that makes sense, yes. Okay, yeah. Maybe Longhorn Ceph and Open EBS would be a better comparison, even though Ceph's not a CNCF project. I think it's still yeah understanding how it's yeah. used. Longhorn Ceph, Open EBS would definitely going to be better, yeah. Because in fact, I've struggled a little bit when I say rook. I in fact, in my mind, that basically <laughs> but basically means Ceph, and but rook is more more than that. Yep. Thanks. All right. All right. So, <clears throat> sorry. Yeah. So uh, this is the status update, and uh, so um, we have our last latest release is one hundred two, and in fact, Longhorn has just released the GA release about five months back, and uh, so that is the uh, happens on the May thirtieth, twenty twenty. And uh, since the uh, and also uh, by the way, just uh, just a reminder that Longhorn has joined the CNCF like last October, which is so now is exactly one year, right? So for after for the period that Longhorn joined the CNCF, it's just one year, but we now have 50 committers from the 10 different companies, and in fact one of the uh, one in fact two of the committers they made a very significant uh, like uh, contribution to Longhorn, so they implement the ARM solution by themselves and submit in the big PR to the Longhorn. And we take, so the Longhorn team took one of them and uh, just add some like, just uh, like polishing it a little bit. And now the ARM support is going to be an experimental feature for the Longhorn 1.1 release. So that's the few, that's a huge thing we saw from heaven in our uh, contributor community. <clears throat> So currently, also I have a bunch of dev states right now, and Longhorn is pretty much very active. Commits per week, fifty-one uh, issue open, twenty-four issue close per week, eighteen, and new PRs per week in twenty-nine. Yes, so those are uh, the state we come uh, we get from dev state .cncf .io. Yeah. So on the right side, uh, you can see that we have huge community growth since we joined the CNCF. And uh, I think the GitHub stars is probably, uh, if I remember correctly, 600 versus like 2,000 right now. Slack user is like two, two, three, 200 versus like a close to 1,000 is like 900 people right now, I think. And the no account, uh, no account, and this was about like 3,000 something, and now we are closing to like 1,500. I think it's 1,400 some, 14,000 something. Yeah, so the, the growth of the community and the usage of Longhorn is is pretty, is in, in fact, it's pretty huge. If you see that um, everything is like jumped at least two, three times to like five times after we join the CNCF. Nice. Yeah, okay. All right, so this, those are the uh, the community building uh, things we do. And the first is we actively, and maintaining the GitHub the Slack channel. And in fact, this I have to uh, say it's, if it's, it's going to be, it's, in fact, it's not easy because our goal is like no unanswered questions. We gain a lot. We, we, we uh, receive a lot from community and we want to make sure that we meet the requirement, right? So if you're looking at Longhorn GitHub uh, issues and Longhorn uh, like Slack channel, you can see that every day we have uh, at least about at least like uh, three, four coming, uh, three, four issues and four, three, four users start asking questions on stuff, right? So basically the responsibility for, uh, for my and my team is to answer those questions and make sure and help them make sure users have their best experience with Longhorn. That's, that's, a, that's a, in fact, for us, it's a, it's a huge thing. 
And secondly, we have a monthly community meeting plus office hour happens on every uh, second Friday of the, of the month. And we are recording is all definitely available on the YouTube and uh, you can check it out and the, uh, in the local community uh, GitHub page, there's a link to the recording there. And also uh, we have moved our infrastructure to CNCF and now long form every night we run a nightly test of uh, for like, currently the time time is about six to seven hours. And those, those nightly test result and also drone build result is like drone going to run for every PR and every merge commit. They are publicly available. All right, <clears throat> sorry. And also we have a metric dashboard, which, uh, which is publicly available as well. This is how we get we no, uh, no node account. So uh, in the short story is we have upgrade server, which is running publicly inside Instead, since they have infrastructure, and uh, when, um, for every hour, they are, you, they are the node running on the local manager is going to ask him for if there are new server version available. That's also why you can see that the users uh, they get notification of the new server, and they very frequently upgrade very soon after the new server come up, right? But when uh, when they when the um, local manager uh, send that request, we know that there's one node available. We don't have any way to identify who that node is, but we just see, okay, this is one request coming. So I count this as new active node. So that's this old, that thing is shown on the metric dashboard, right? That's is all public available. And also we have uh, participated in the KubeCon and uh, for the uh, KubeCon EU, we have hosted the booth, uh, booth and office hour, two office hours plus one session. So that's uh, in fact, the and also we run a survey and got about 300 response and regarding the, the Kubernetes uh, storage, cloud native storage and why people using it or why people not using it, right? But uh, um, unfortunately in the end, we feel like the sample size is probably still too small to, to reach any like a definite, uh, definite conclusion. So I uh, so we didn't really end up publishing an official report on that. Mm. Okay. So, those are uh, some of the end users using Longhorn in production. And those end users are all, we gathered all this information from um, the public user channel. Those are not like a rancher users. Those are all open source users. They're not a paying rancher or like uh, for anything, right? So those are uh, one, the first one is the tribunal regional. Okay, so I can not pronounce Spanish. Okay, it's the regional electoral court of the state of Para, Brazil. And uh, they are using uh, long range production story backend with Prometheus, Minion, and the PG admin. And the second one is uh, Simra, and it's a health information tech con uh, technology. And the third one is TYK, and they are also using long form in one of the next like, so in their uh, service management platform. So, um, so how how so we uh, basically how we get those end users is we basically just shout out in the Slack channel and and asking if we're asking them for help for our incubation process, right? So that's why, uh, that's why we got, that's how we got this. And also we reach out to a few um, users in the GitHub that we saw that really frequently interaction with us and asking questions and stuff to, and want to know if they can help. And that's also some of the case here. And, and just to confirm these end users are, um, are not commercial rancher users. Therefore, they 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 are using the open source version of the product. Uh, yes, yeah, they are not commercial rancher users, and also, um, in fact, the commercial there's no commercial version of Longhorn. So, uh, rancher only sells support. So, even their commercial rancher users, they are going to use the same open source product. Yeah, we just like provide them support as as a rancher labs, right? So, though, but those are not even like rancher commercial users. Yeah, they they are bound, they they are okay. bunch of branch commercial users. Yeah, but we we I think it's better to show uh, the open on the open source side, and so that's why we reach out the user in this way rather than uh, depends on the rancher customer to do so. Okay, and and sorry, I, I I'm I'm just going to ask a few questions on this because yeah. we got we 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 had um, similar um, questions that came up at another project. Recently, um, I just want to confirm that 
the, the, the reason why I'm asking around the commercial rancher thing is, is because I want to make sure that these users are not using um, some service or, or, or some function that's only available in the commercial rancher edition, but not available in the open source edition, if you see what I mean. Yeah, I see. Yeah. So no, they uh, they will definitely open using open source hundred percent because in fact there's no uh, we don't make any like commercial version or like proprietary version of Longhorn. So even they want they, they don't have a way to use that anyway, even for the rancher customers. So it's the same for the rancher. Rancher is hundred percent open source, right? So as a rancher customer, you get in the version of the rancher is the exactly same you download from the GitHub. Got it. Understood. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I think the sunlight is. Okay. Sorry. All right. So those are the roadmap, and for uh, November, we're going to release one one point uh, one release soon, and it's going to include in the native upgrade read write many support, and we're doing that using NFS on top of Longhorn block device, and also the Prometheus CSI snapshot support, and there's some data locality feature. As uh, and also the ARM support, which is experimental, and as mentioned, the ARM support is coming from the contribution from uh, in the community. And in the future, we are going to do the Longhorn CLI and the SPDK application backup restore, and uh, ex uh, and also some other items. So this is just uh, like overviews of what we see in the roadmap. Okay. Okay. All right. So that's all. Next. Okay, so, uh, thank you. So any other questions I can answer? Yes, yes. Uh, Alex, can I, can I ask? Of course, go for it. Yeah, so th thanks, thanks, Hank. Uh, so I have a couple of questions, right? Uh, first of all, um, if um, someone has already some existing data somewhere, right? On a, on a bucket or a Ceph or something like that, is there a way to migrate into login core or they have to manually, you know, create a pod that mounts. Uh, yeah, in fact, in fact, that question come up, uh, I think a, a few months back. Yeah, but uh, yeah, currently uh, we don't have a native way to to help you to migrate from other storages, but mm -hmm. you can always do as Kubernetes, mm -hmm. you can always do that you create a new PVC and the, mount mm -hmm. the, and the both old and new PVC into the pod and around the CP. Mm -hmm. I guess same in between, yes. But this is one item mm -hmm. we're tracking, and we mm -hmm. um, and we think we can provide some help. In fact, not just from other storage vendor to like to Longhorn, because we see Kubernetes as provide very flexible way of operating between the mm -hmm. uh, storage vendors. So we probably can provide a tool for you to help move from any storage vendor to any storage vendor. So that's mm -hmm. that's how we see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that would help a lot on the adoption, I think, one. Uh, second question. Uh, so you mentioned a bit about the snapshots and the recovery and all this stuff. Is it, um, is it, uh, are you utilizing the features of CSI about uh, snaps, uh, about, uh, you know, the new, the new methods about uh, snapshots and uh, restore and all this time and all these things from yeah, so, the so CSI? Yeah, so on the roadmap, in fact, is the currently this feature is already. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry, I did not. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. the CSI snapshot support. This is uh, the snapshot in the in this context, we're mapping it to not really the snapshot in, in Longhorn, it's going to be the like backup, the backup mm -hmm. in the Longhorn, right? Because it's the backup that you can migrate outside of uh, the volume. For a snapshot, Longhorn snapshot, you're always going to be using it inside uh, the Longhorn volume, mm -hmm. right? So the CSI snapshot support is yeah, yeah, well the, be there for the one It's on the roadmap. Okay, and the, the final uh, suggestion, I think more, and also you know if you can answer, um, I, I think the engine. So I wasn't aware of the project. I'm just learning today. Uh, the project uh, reminds me a bit uh, um, a Luxio because it is also a storage engine, not so much as to look because you know you are also a storage engine itself. So maybe some comparison with Aluxio might make sense, you know, for, um, I, think, I think it's more similar than, than Rook because, because you have the, uh, your own uh, storage engine. Um, yeah. yeah, so yeah, I think I have 
um, I have heard this name and I um, well, I haven't like looked into what how they do it and uh, yeah so yeah we can, we can we can just try to see if we can yeah, yeah just for you to have a look on the project it's um, similar with the different layers of uh, uh, of storage so they they have something uh, something similar it's, they're not so Kubernetes integrated as far as I remember but uh, yeah okay. just for you to yeah thanks yeah. thanks for the presentation. I I, for what it's worth, I, I believe Alexio are are more of a are more of a caching engine than than a storage engine. Yeah, 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 yeah. So basically, my point was also it's it's kind of difficult to compare with um, uh, with Rook because Rook doesn't provide their own uh, storage engine. Right. Instead, it would make sense to compare with something like. Uh, but they have they have their own. Um, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, you can use you can use Aluxio without having other uh, other um, as as a standalone backing store as well. Uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, right? Right. Um, hey, hey, Sheng. Just yeah. just a few other things in terms of the um, the incubation criteria. Um, so, so it looks like the number of um, the number of committers has um, has has improved quite quite a lot recently. Um, it, would you be able to to share um, maybe some ratios of sort of um, rancher committers versus external oh, yes. committers? Yeah. In fact, let me see if I can do that right now. Sorry. The light is on my face. <laughs> That's all right. Yeah, let me see. Should we on the no? Sorry, this is a Dev status always forgot. Oh yeah, okay. Navigate it. No, this is the latest. Complete statistic. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, table. Yeah. This is the contributions. Let me see. Commit. Yeah. So it's the still the super majority is coming from the rancher labs and also their other uh, from independence and yeah. I think other and also the CNCF help with the, the website and the few project. There's some contribution with SUSE recently and some others. Yeah. So this is the what we have right now. I think. Got it. All right. So okay. any other, yeah. Any other questions that can answer? No, I think I think um, I think that's fine. Um, would it be possible to 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 share a PDF um, or a link to, to oh, sure. the presentation? Yeah. So I uh, I I was in that you. Excellent. All right then. Does does anybody else have any um, questions for Shang? All right. In that case, thanks. Thank you so much, Sheng. This has been a, a, a really great Excellent. presentation, um, and we uh, we look forward to, to making our recommendation to the CIC. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you. All right. See you, Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. -bye.